Hey everyone, it is Wednesday morning and as a part of our expert series, you know we bring back Anna Kelly. How are you doing, Anna? I'm great today. How about you, Michael? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. So I think, we should, uh, I think we should jump in last week. And uh, folks, if you don't know, Anna has her whole playlist on my channel. So you can go back and watch all of her interviews. And there are lots of them. And they're all great. But she's talking about a deal at the beach, a big house on the sand. And uh, last week, we had um, some questions about can she get the financing that she wants. So why don't we start there? Sure. So as we kind of talked about before, this is a, a very large beach house. And so it's above the jumbo loan limits that puts it out in a, a territory that makes it not easy to, to finance uh, as easy as, you know, financing a beach home that's up to about a $500,000 limit. So that makes the regulation stronger in terms of, you know, the underwriters having to check their boxes and not make very many exceptions. And also, I found that the way that I wanted to take it down, what the lender initially told me, they found out that the, the, the second provider that does a, a HELOC at the same time as the first mortgage didn't want to do anybody that had more than four mortgages in their name. And yeah. so that was kind of my hurdle. I said, well, that's kind of a problem because I've got, you know, a lot. Yeah. Um, and you got so, more than four, you know, huh? One lender, <laughs> yeah, more than four. So one lender said no. Um, you know, basically what happens with this jumbo loan is that the first mortgage is tapped at that jumbo limit so that mm -hmm. they can still sell it. So on, you know, a $725,000 purchase price, the max loan I could get is a 70% LTV or, you know, just over 500,000, which means I got to come down with, you know, 30% down. So the way that I wanted to make this work was to have a 20% HELOC on top of the original first that closes at the same time and then just have to put 10% down. So I found a lender that'll do it. And I got past the first initial review hurdle, you know, for that lender. So they've said, okay, we've looked at everything. Everything looks good so far. Still don't have my 2019 taxes back for my accountant. Uh, but I sent them, you know, a lot of other things to justify income and to meet their debt coverage service ratio that they require. Um, and so we're moving forward. It looks like things are, are moving forward and I'm just waiting for approval. Yeah, so there's kind of two other forces we just need to acknowledge here. A, your family wants this house. They're they're yes. in love with they're in love with the house, and you're the one putting the deal together, right? So that's a an interesting discussion. Correct. It, it becomes again kind of a hybrid investment. You know, would I buy this just to be a great investment in cash flow? No, I wouldn't. I could buy a much less expensive beach rental and make a lot more in terms of cash on cash return. But if I can get into this deal that's going to be great for my family to enjoy, you know, for 20 or 30 years as, as we grow. Yeah. Um, and then it also basically covers the mortgage and covers the expenses and makes a little bit of profit. It's a win-win uh, as a hybrid investment and luxury. Yeah, there are just sometimes you do a deal. And again, I love the fact that you're, again, I call them alligators, as you know, right? The fact that this will not be an alligator for you is, something clearly you're managing to and your family's yeah. like get the deal done get the deal done get the deal done yeah so it's yeah. fun to watch and i've let them know you know it has to also make sense as an investment so if they can figure out how to do it where i only have to put 10 percent down then we'll move forward and if they can't then we may not um and we'll just be content with the one we have until the next one comes available so there you, there you go and the other the other factor we have to realize is again um there's a seller involved right? There's a seller that yeah. had this in contract with someone else that uh, didn't sell their home. So the deal fell apart. Uh, he then came to you and, and gave a, a better price, uh, yes. which, which you locked it up in. So I'm just curious. Uh, I know who you are as a person, but we're going to tell the audience how you're communicating with the seller, what's going on and all the hurdles you're getting through. I'm, I'm convinced there's constant communication, but let's just acknowledge that. Sure. So this was a listed deal. So my agent is, is a dual agent in this case. I've done a couple of other properties with him and so has the seller. So we're both comfortable with him, you know, as our go between. Mm -hmm. um, so he's keeping the seller abreast of things. We've talked about, you know, possibility of some seller financing as a second, if I could get the first and, you know, if the price is right, he's willing to entertain that as well, but he'd prefer not to do some seller financing. So okay. you know, he's allowing me the time I need to get the, the lending boxes checked. And if we've got to extend, we can do that. Um, and he's been you know, very amenable at this point. Yeah. And I just wanted to bring that up because again, when you're dealing you know, with real estate, it's a, it's a people business, 
And, yes. you know, selling a, a house like this with somebody who's already had a transaction blow up at the last minute, you just, you just got to be a, continue to be a good person and communicate, whether that's you or your agent. He, just, he or she just needs to feel that you're doing the right things. And, and I thought that was important to say. Yes, very, very much so. Yeah. Very cool. So, all right. So let's, uh, let's change gear. So again, we'll talk next week and we'll see how you're doing um, on, the on the second. That's really the question at this point. It's the second. Right. Uh, so, so we'll follow up with that. I want to talk about Friday's, last Friday's surprising jobs number. A, were you surprised? Because you're so smart. Maybe you saw it coming. I didn't. <laughs> uh, but why don't we start there? Were you surprised by, uh, by that number? Yes and no. Okay. All <laughs> That's right. not the answer you wanted to hear. But no, it's fine. I, I was somewhat surprised that it was so good. But the, the part of me that is just kind of looking at this thing and saying, is it too early to get excited yet? And diving a little deeper. The one thing that keeps me from being overly optimistic that this is like a new trend and recovery is on its way mm -hmm. is the fact that we had these PPP loans, Michael. Yeah. So all these people that took PPP loans thought they only had eight weeks to hire everybody back. So these job numbers and the hires happened before the Fed changed the PPP numbers and said, okay, we'll now give you to the end of the year. Yeah. So there was a rush to get everybody back employed and back on the payrolls in order to have that PPP forgiven. So I just wonder how much of that, you know, new jobs created was really a matter of people getting their old jobs back that may or may not keep them if the company decides to cut costs once they've met their obligation to the PPP loan to get it forgiven. So I just don't think, I think it's too early to tell how much of that was rehires because of PPP. Mm. I looked for the data, but I wasn't able to find anything yeah. on that. Um, so I think we wait to see what the next job reports and job creation reports look like and see, are we really hiring back a lot more people in new jobs? Um, and what is the total unemployment number? And is that number going up? Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I was really surprised. I had not thought about the PPP loans, uh, but you're right. I think a lot of people came, a lot of people either kept jobs or were rehired back. Uh, but the other thing I think, I think June, right. will 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 be reported the first week of July for June, I think is going to be even bigger because what, what is now happening is New York and California are opening up, right? Which are the two most populous states. Right. And, right. you know, logic says, even if you're hiring back half the people, it's going to artificially look good. So I'm going to be really interested to see what happens in kind of August and September. I think June will be, I mean, June could be an eight to 10 million number. Um, right. Yeah. And hopefully so, you know, hopefully yeah. a lot of these companies that had to shut their doors, they're right back in business right away. I, I think definitely, you know, the travel industry, the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, I think people in those sectors of employment are probably going to be laid off a bit longer. So mm -hmm. I'd love to see kind of a slice and dice of the types of jobs that are rehiring mm -hmm. um, and the location. But I think it's good news that companies are opening back up and you know, wanting to get back to business again. And, and that is good news for those that are unemployed looking for a job. Yeah. Yeah. So then the other thing that I've been looking at is I, I actually think Friday could have been the, the event that causes all of these sellers who took properties off the market for the spring selling season to go blitz list. So again, the next domino I am looking for is national listings of real estate to break that 1.1 uh, level, right? If you go back right. the last three years, we were between 1.3 and 1.5 active listings in June. And now we're like at 1.05 going into June. So we, are, we were low before and then we went you know, 30% lower or 25% lower. Um, so I'm going to be looking for you know, active listing counts to see if they increase week to week to week. Um, sure. Because I just, I, you know, I think the spring selling season could become a seller s selling season or they're not going to show up and we just lost a year. So, I, I, you know, I don't know if you're seeing anything yet about more listings coming, but uh, just curious. Yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot more listings here over the last week or two. Oh, nice. Than what we had before. So that's good. And quite a few have actually gone under contract really, really quickly. So there's still uh, buyers that want to buy houses and there's still sellers that are you know, saying, okay, it's, it's a good time to sell top of the market and maybe even considering re relocating. So yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a big uptick in activity over the last two weeks. Ah, I like it when I can call the dominoes. Uh, so that's interesting because what th this is, what this will be the event 
that will either mean prices go up or down because clearly without question, listings have been, active listings have been below demand. Hence, when listings go up, you see a lot of stuff go into contract because you have a waiting pool of buyers who have missed out on other things. But here's the rub. If the active listings continue to spike, right, as, as you, your neighbor lists, they go pending, you go, ooh, ow, let me list two, right? We could very soon get to a point where listings dwarf demand because maybe the demand pool is not as deep as we think it is. Um, this is where we're going. So we're going to, if, if the listings continue through June, we're going we're gonna to find out how deep that demand pool is. Because that's the question, right? How can you have, you know, double digit unemployment and a robust housing market? Right? It's just. Yeah. And then the question is whether those are qualified buyers and how many can actually get loans. And yeah. that's, you know, that's a key right now. So even mm -hmm. though, you know, rates are low, treasuries did go up just a little bit, which Tick, doesn't yeah. impact individual residential homes as much. Um, but if buyers can't get a loan because the lender's a little more nervous, they want a little more in reserves, they want a, a better credit score than even what the you know, agencies require, then you could see a slowing um, in, in qualified buyers. So interestingly, I have seen an uptick in USDA buyers in our area. So um, I had a property listed, I had multiple offers, all of them USDA. So 100% financing, you know, want the seller to pay their closing costs and, wow. and get in that way. So those programs are still out there and still viable. So I think it's very much going to be dependent on, again, where you're located yeah. and supply and the demand and, and how hard hit um, that area was during COVID. Yeah. Again, a lot of things we've been talking about, I think, I think our ability to look at the future and call our shot are playing out, right? You're seeing without question, New York, San Francisco, LA now, um, people are leaving. Rents are falling, right? In, in verticalized living. Uh, their yeah. suburb movement is coming. New construction below, at the median and below, flying off the shelves. Uh, and a mortgage demand, right? Again, applications, to your point, that's not approval. It's just apps, is up seven weeks in a row now. And it's 13% higher as of this morning than last year. That's great. The yeah. demand is there. Um, but you're right. That's not a yes. A demand is not a yes answer. So right, right. Pr pretty, pretty interesting. The other good news that I saw Friday that we can talk about is uh, we both talked about forbearance and all the tweaks they've been making to the forbearance program. I don't know if you saw this, but forbearance, first off, two weeks ago, fell from several hundred thousand to 7,000 new requests. Last week went negative, meaning people are coming off of it. Yeah. Um, so this foreclosure, short sale crisis that we kind of envisioned when the original rules came out, they seem to have successfully kicked the can down the line. They tweaked how the, 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 the missing payments will be treated now as a 0% second. Uh, I don't, I mean, there will be some pain, but nothing near what could have been. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's why it's so hard to predict what's going to happen because every time you think you've figured something out. It's like, oh, the, the, you know, the government puts in a stopgap. So again, they just continue to work to, you know, extend the time people have to pay off PPP if you're a small business, extend the time that you have to pay off a mortgage if you had to go into forbearance. So all of those things the Fed is stepping in and doing mm -hmm. is really uh, trying to get in front of, uh, of a collapse and, and keep everything propped up and keep people from going into mass foreclosure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it is pretty clear. Again, we're saying this on June 10th, right? Rules could change. But as of June 10th, I'm fairly certain that in 95% of the markets, real estate, single family homes, prices are going to go up this year, yeah. right? Prices will go up. There will be New York will go down. San Francisco will go down. Vegas probably will go down. Although I, I did an interview with a broker in Vegas and of all things, um, uh, May prices went up. Now, transactions were 50% below, but still prices right. were up. It's craziness. Yeah. Um, so I think the single there's family is going to be okay. Yeah, there's some reports I know in the multifamily space where we can really look and see, you know, where what regions and areas have hyper supply, you know, mm -hmm. down to major metros yeah. um, of housing in general that would apply to individual homes as well. Um, but even within those major metros, you know, you've got suburban homes, you've got in-city homes. There's such a wide variety that it's hard to get super, super granular. Mm -hmm. I think several MSAs are in hyper supply. Oh, no question. For those cities that are, you know, already very, very dense. So I think to your point about a move to the suburbs, I think occupancy kind of dips 
and prices may fall a little bit in the city. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, people that want to move out to the suburbs, prices are going to go up. Yeah, no question. I, I think it's, and again, where I was going with that is I don't think, you know, every crisis, there isn't a thing that where the maximum pain is, right? The 08 yeah. crisis was no question, single family homes. The 2020 right. crisis will not be single family homes. Yeah. It's going to be commercial. Now, commercial is a big bucket, right? Because it's right. got hospitality and retail and industrial and warehouse and, you know, storage and all of that stuff. But I do think, again, in our, our area, multifamily, there will be some pain there. Uh, we're already seeing rent deflation in markets that you didn't think it could happen, right? Who would think rents would go down in New York? San Francisco, almost 10% in a month. Yeah, yeah. And central Pennsylvania, we actually, we held off on some rent increases during COVID, but for new listings, we're actually seeing increases in rents here right now. Fully occupied, lots of people looking for apartments again. So again, that supply and demand factor is so, so important. No matter what you invest in, you've got to be in areas where there is more demand than there is supply. And as soon as you start investing in areas where there's more supply than there is demand, there's going to be pain point in those sectors. And so again, it's the big cities that are overbuilding multifamily. Yeah. They're the ones where the multifamily are going to be hit. But in these smaller secondary markets, we're really not seeing very much of a hit. Um, and I saw an interesting article today, Michael, I don't know if you saw it yet today, but it was posted on um, multifamily that had retail on the bottom. Mm. And it talked about how even though the retail spaces, small mixed use buildings were hurting, Mm-hmm. Landlords were actually more profitable because the apartment rents were so consistent and still coming in wow. that the mixed use buildings with retail on the bottom were, were doing much, much better than those that were just retail, you know, just purely commercial office, et cetera. Interesting. I'm going to look at those. I actually bought one of those uh, during the last crisis. A bank came to me where I bought a house from and then they brought me this mixed use, which it's the only one I own. Yeah. It, it, it's a nail salon on one side. And I forget what was on the other. Both of those are shut down. We've, we've given them free rents because we, we're in a financial position where we can do that. So they don't owe any rent or lease, I guess you would call it. Uh, but the upstairs units, those are still rented, right? The, the two bedroom, two, two bedroom, I think they're two twos. Those are rented and still coming in. And basically we're break even. Uh, we're a little negative, but again, it's because we're given the two um, mixed use tenants free rent. So yeah, right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look for those because there may be pain there. I'm yeah. actually, I'm going to go look for those. I'm going to go yeah. see if I can steal some of those. Especially if they're in a good area that's going to come back. Oh yeah. The street's awesome. It's, it's had 10, 10 or 15 million bucks put in right in the area since I bought. So it's increased in value. So I'm actually going to go search. I'm going to go seek that out. See, look at that. Yeah. You just gave me something to go look for. That's awesome. Awesome. So, yeah. I like it. I like buying stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, uh, again, this all comes to learn your market, right? I you know, if you're in the residential space, I know it's, it's been tough, right? Because just in the last two or three months, I've said, watch out, be careful. Uh, forbearance is, is not the thing. A lot of people are going to get hurt. Look for things in late 2020 to early 2021. Now that's off the table. Now I'm telling you, hey, in many suburbia markets, you're actually going to have price increases because lack of supply, all this stuff going on. Learn your market. Today, I would tell you for the next month, watch active listings. Because yeah. that is going to tell us because active listings could come go from 1.1, again, nationally up to 1.4, which is where it's historically been, or it could explode higher. You just don't know. Right. 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 So um, learn your market, watch it carefully. Because I think I, right now the market is changing. Residential market is changing. You have to watch. Don't be in a rush. Right. Right. Play yeah. the long game. We always say that. Yeah. And, and it's scary. I had a, I had a, a, a viewer call me. Um, what is today, Wednesday? So it was probably Monday and I did a video on it. He was in a rush. He had to buy a five unit building, right? So it's commercial. So that you, you'll know this, uh, all three, two. So, you know, that's a lot of people for a small footprint. So kind of risky yeah. there, but here's the deal. He locked it up at 475, had an appraisal done and appraisal came in at 430. Wow. Right. And the seller's not budging. And he's like, is it a deal? Is it a deal? I'm like, <laughs> What, what are you kidding me? It doesn't scream, not a deal, right? right. The appraisal. Oh, by the way, you've already got to put 35% down because it's commercial financing. And now you've got to put another 40K down. You no, need me you. to tell you this is not a deal. Okay. I'll tell you it's not a deal. Right. Right. It's, 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 be uh, patient. Be patient. Don't be in a rush. Yeah. This market is really dangerous because there's so few 
listings, you could have money burning a hole in your pocket and you just feel like you have to move. That is the wrong thing to do. Cash is okay. Right, right. You got to get comfortable with that. I, I was really uncomfortable with that for a while. But yeah, you, especially when there's not comps and you just can't see exactly what's going to happen in the market, it takes some time to see what the recovery is going to look like. If you know that something's a still a smoking deal, then, then go for it. But otherwise, don't buy anything mediocre. You got to build in a lot of risk and you know, yeah, get, a, yeah. get a really good deal on the buy in this kind of market in order to know that you're still going to be okay no matter what comes. Yeah, folks, you got to learn your market. Don't be in a rush just because, I mean, having money could be dumb money. I mean, that would have right. been a dumb deal. And I mean, right. his assumptions were terrible. He's thinking $30,000 to remodel um, three bedroom, two baths. He was going to take rents from nine to 1400. I'm like, Oh my God, you're going to spend a hundred grand on the yeah. remodel. And oh, but yeah, it's, it was, it was bad on so many different levels. It, it's, yeah. But it, that, I hear that a lot. I'm like, I know it's hard to hear. Slow down. Right. Go right. look at your market for 30 days in a row and pretend like you have no money in the bank. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel better yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this show's all about. It's, you know, teaching people to make wise decisions by the right kind of deals in the right kind of market and do your and homework in the long game. Yeah. Do your homework. So I saw on Facebook, you first off hurt your back. So I hope you're feeling better. Thank you. Yeah. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Oh, you're, you look okay. You're not, you're not yeah. stiff, but you yeah. were doing a, a, a due diligence on a deal. It looked like. Yeah, we are. We're, we had a, a property that we've had under contract actually pre-COVID. Oh. Um, it was a, a property coming out of a Section 8 HUD program. Hmm. And because it wasn't a Section 8 HUD program, the loan documents actually said the seller had to notify all the tenants 180 days in advance of, putting, uh, of settling and selling a property. Oh, wow. So we had to put the sale on hold. And you know, it, it, we, we had it under contract through COVID. It's done really well through COVID. And, you know, we finally are able to start our due diligence process back up and, and get ready to do that. Where, where is it? Where? It's in central Pennsylvania. So this would be for your personal, your family's portfolio. Um, it is a joint venture deal. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Very, very cool. And uh, let's just talk about it because it was mentioned section eight uh, has been doing awesome through this event, yes. right? <laughs> it actually has. That makes the deal, you know, much more attractive than we even thought it might be before. So we won't keep it as a HUD project and a, a HUD complex, but we will accept Section 8. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And and the government's paying rents. There's no people skipping. So yeah. that's not. Nice. Well, let's just talk about Section 8 because I don't think you and I have talked about it before. Um, do you accept Section 8 in other properties that you own? We're, we just started allowing that really through the time of COVID. We okay. had one that we said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll consider it. Uh, we had more and more requests for Section 8. Mm -hmm. And in our area, the Section 8 rents are, are pretty high, the allowable rents. So they're not okay. too far off of market anyway. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple of Section 8 tenants that we accepted during the COVID crisis. And now we've started to kind of open it up to more. Yeah, I, I actually enjoy the Section 8 program, sort of where I came from. So I'm comfortable with that as a, as a child, right? That was, that was around us. Um, yeah. We didn't have anything. So I've been accepting it all along. Uh, I think about, it'll be close. I think about 35%, maybe 38 are Section 8 tenants across my entire oh, wow. portfolio. Oh. And I like, obviously like the program. Uh, it makes me feel good. Uh, a lot of the tenants are living in units that'll be the best they ever live in, given the, the updates that we do. But the other thing I like, because I'm so far away from my property, is I love the yearly check-ins. That does, frankly, annoy other landlords because you get a long list of little things. Oh, the carpet's peeling up. There's a, uh, there's a single tile cracked here or there, right? But I like that because I consider it checking the checker, right? I already pay a property right. manager right. monthly. Uh, and I actually use those Section 8 reports to go, hey, hey. Yeah, you're not doing your job over here. What what's going on, right? Uh, so I I appreciate those check-ins. Some landlords hate them, and that's actually why a lot of landlords don't deal with Section Eight. But right. I appreciate those yearly check-ins, and also a, a lot of them says this is a tenant issue. Tenants not keeping the house clean or whatever, right? So right. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, program, yeah, so. yeah, that's a really really good point. Yeah. So I'm curious as we, uh, you know, what's, what's big for the week? Is it, is it continuing the due diligence? Is it, uh, what, 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 what's Anna working on this week so we can follow up next week? Yes. Continuing due diligence, uh, talking to different lenders, the lending landscape changes daily. 
uh, working on my coaching program, my coaching students, um, and I'm speaking at an event uh, for the investors on Friday. Nice. And so that's the rest of my week. Well, let's talk about your coaching program because I'm so excited you were doing that. Uh, I know it's it's been a personal draw for you. And also I know that that, that could potentially consume a lot of your time. Uh, how's it been? Um, yeah, just how's it been? I, I, I look forward to watching that grow. Very, very good. So the, our first uh, course live webinar is Thursday of this week. Mm. And our, our uh, live coaching calls start next week. So we've got a, a really good group, about 16 people. Nice. And we'll be, you know, plugging away and helping them to, to figure out what their goals are and how to, you know, take down the right types of deals to help them to, to reach that financial freedom number. Very, very cool. So where can people find out more about it? Uh, info at reimom.com is my email. So you could email me there. My website is reimom.com. I will put that in the show notes. I'm just taking a quick note. reimom.com. That's right. Very, very cool. Well, Anna, thank you very much for giving us your time every Wednesday. It's greatly appreciated. Good luck on getting that second. I look forward to uh, a Facebook update or our conversation next week with a, we're doing it. Awesome. Uh, so thank you so much. Yep. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.